Be seated. Good morning. My name is Philip Duncan. I am the bishop retired from the Diocese of the Central Gulf Coast. And yes, that is the area in Florida and Lower Alabama. And it is one of the places where my wife and I moved away from mm, the lower part of Florida to get away from hurricanes. <laughs> In our time there, we only had three. <laughs> so be careful what you do in life because sometimes they have a way of following you, dear friends. I am a friend of your previous rector who is now at St. David's. I knew him when we were uh, the dean of Dallas and we belonged to a group. And I must say that I am also a friend of your present rector and a colleague whom I have known for an equally long time. And I could not and will not not allow the fact that I am also a friend of his wife. And Lisa, it's always good to see you and be with you both. Kathy and I are here today, and we are here today um, at the invitation of Father Ray, and we are here also at the invitation of your bishops so that I may be able to do confirmation. The first poem that I ever remember being assigned to commit to memory was by a wonderful poet, Edwin Markham. When he moved to New York, he took off his first name Charles, left his second name uh, or his third name go, and just decided to be Edwin Markham. He drew a circle to shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout, but love and I, we had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took him in. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I share with you the conviction that without knowing it, he summed up what we are about as Christians. That no matter how others may try to shoo us away, no matter how others may try to expel others, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that offers us hope and salvation in drawing those ever-widening bands to bring others within the reach of God's saving embrace. I met my wife when I was in seminary in New York City. And in one particular spot on her church, over the front door, it said, Solo Deo Gloria. When we went to Clearwater, Florida, and I had left Ridgewood, New Jersey as a curate and was going to Ridgewood as their new vicar in a, in a new plant for a church, we got there and one of the members had just decided that they wanted to give alms basins. And they were brass. And they were absolutely beautiful. Before that, they had been using wicker baskets, which I also loved. But 
I remembered those words, solo Deo Gloria. And we had that put into the bottoms of those plates. Solo Deo Gloria, to God alone should be given or be the glory. To God alone be the glory. And when the plates came back, I looked at them. And they had abbreviated it. S D G. And only four of us knew what it meant. So we printed it in the bulletins for years. To God alone be the glory. How is it that we live that? We live that with the teachings and through our passions that we come to praise Almighty God for the gifts that God has given us. It's a bridge between Jesus' teaching and his passion. Teaching on the Mount of Olives, looking across to the Hedron, and there is the temple. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew are impressed by the temple's beauty. Impressed by the temple's beauty. And Jesus reminds them to attend to things that last like the kingdom of God. Jesus' teaching, this chapter, is a teaching chapter. And soon, it's a transition chapter into the next part of Mark's gospel. And that's the getting ready for him to turn over his life or our life. To attend now to the last things like the kingdom of God. There was a time where the desolating sacrifice was looking at how, how Antiochus Epiphanes, who, who was a interloper into that area, a Greek ruler, placed the statue of Zeus in the temple. That was in around 167 BC. And then the abomination, which probably refers to the Antichrist and the destruction of the temple in about 70 AD. When I was a student in, in Israel, I used to love to go across and be able to sit in the spot that overlooked the Holy Mount. When at one point I was able to bring my wife over there and we spent some time there on pilgrimage, we went over there and I expected to sit there in quiet contemplation and just enjoy what that meant. However, the 40 buses that were there, with all of the tourists flashing away on their cameras and playing music and donkey rides and camel rides being hawked, I thought, hmm, not very much fun, but probably the same way it was when Jesus was there the same understanding. And the abomination may actually refer to the Antichrist and the destruction of that temple. This chapter, 
this chapter 13 of Mark is a transitional chapter. It's the apocalyptic section. Nero was killing Christians at the time that this gospel was being written. A national disaster for the Jews. For us, I have no way of even describing how that might be, except that my first week as bishop of my new diocese, that first week my wife was there, we were in a little rental apartment, and we had on the news, and I was just getting ready to, to, to leave for the office, and I thought, good Lord, what is going on? These, the, they've taken the news and they've co-opted it into some kind of a, in some kind of a, a movie. And what I was watching was the airplanes for 9-11 plowing into those buildings. And I've thought about that for years how that desolating sacrilege can only be in that sense. There is a sense of, I suppose, many ways of describing how that meant and was for the Jews. It could be pipelines across sacred lands. It could be garbage dumps under children's playgrounds. It could be watersheds for where we're drinking our, getting our drinking water, whatever it is that, that is appalling to us, take that and for the Jew, that's what this was about. We come to the end of the church's year, not today, but next week. And soon we'll be in Advent and preparing for the coming of the Christ child. Be attentive, be alert. Prepare to help build the new Jerusalem because that's what we are about as the people of God. My wife's parish was a really fabulous place in Westchester County and her two priests were wonderful men of God. They both were on, had been one on the faculty at at um, Yale and the other student at Yale. And they had a lot of friends and one of the friends they had who was back from Germany and had just written another book was Paul Tillich. And that was in 1967. And Tillich's book stated something that was so obvious and yet it was so important. There's a difference between fear and anxiety. Fear has a definable object and can be faced. Anxiety faces an abyss and nothing can make it go away. God's light and God's love in Jesus, my friends, is an abyss. It's an abyss. We have no way to control it. We have no way to manage it. We cannot know the future. God does. Our task, our task as Christians is to be present. Present to the presence of God and God's gift to us. Carpe Deum, seize the day written over the entrance of my dorm when I lived in New York City. Carpe Deum. May God bless us on this day as we move forward in our faith knowing that the transition for all of us comes sooner than later 
and that that chapter 13 in Mark stands as a time to move forward in God's faith. I want to quote and close with a quotation from C.S. Lewis in his work, Mere Christianity. Don't waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the greatest secrets. When you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to love him. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him more. If you do him a good turn, you will find yourself disliking him less. What kind of circles will you draw on this day and in your life? May God bless us in all the works we do. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Will you stand, please?